So hello everybody. Um, today we, um, if you check the syllabus, we um, the original plan was to do it in Magnus collection and um, and uh, because I think it's a very interesting place and I always realize that a lot of students don't know um, what the where the collection is, what the collection is, and I decided to visit it again. I did it um, before with uh, previous uh, lectures and seminars. I um, thought that this session today is um, especially interesting because we talked in the last lecture on the very small minority of Germans. So I focused on uh, Germany, not the occupied territory. So the minority of Germans who were somehow involved in protest or resistance. And it's always very important to me that um, this it is a very small group, but nevertheless, I try to show you the variety. So some of them were, um, um, were part of the resistance for religious reasons. Others um, came from the Communist Party or the Social Democrats. Others were like split offs of the former parties of the Weimar Republic. And um, today I would like to, to introduce the Magnus Collection and also discuss a little bit uh, or to start to talk about um, anti fascist propaganda. So, this will be one of my questions at at the end if we will if we should talk about political activism or is are some ca caricatures or cartoons or documents also a sort of propaganda but simply anti-fascist propaganda or if it makes a difference at all to call it propaganda so this was my uh, or is an interesting question for me um, I would also like to introduce uh, Francesco Spagnolo, who is the curator of the Magnus uh, collection, and he will talk about the collection and introduce the collection. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you, Isabel, for this wonderful uh, introduction. As I speak, I'm also clicking, admitting people to the to the meeting, so I'm I'm multitasking. Uh, as Isabel said, my name is Francesco Spagnolo. And uh, please use the chat if there's any problem with connections you can't hear or anything. Both Isabel and I can, can manage that. And uh, we're co-hosting this meeting. And uh, Francesco Spagnolo, my name. I'm curator, as Isabel said, of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at UC Berkeley. I also teach in uh, music and Jewish studies. And, um, and um, uh, today I'm focusing uh, on well, this is an ongoing collaboration with Isabel and her classes that have been coming to the Magnus uh, 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 for for quite some time. I'm focusing on an exhibition we had just opened before everything closed down with shelter in place, uh, but it's actually very well documented online. So I have a lot of materials to to share. Uh, before I start, let me just say two words uh, about the Magnus. Uh, the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world. Uh, the third largest in North America, and it's the only one in the world that's part of a research university. Uh, it, it started out as an independent Jewish museum in uh, Berkeley in 1962, and in 2010, so 10 years ago, it uh, joined UC Berkeley. Uh, since then, and you will see some of this in my presentation, um, since then uh, the collection is being studied, researched, and exhibited a lot in partnership with colleagues, with, uh, with faculty, with visiting visiting uh, artists and scholars, and very much with the participation of UC Berkeley students, both uh, uh, graduate and undergraduate students. And some of the work that I will be discussing today is really featuring uh, the, the collection of research done in partnership with students. Um, so uh, third largest museum collection in, in, in the United States means a couple of things. First of all, it means about 20,000 objects from all over the world. It's a, it's a pan-diasporic collection. Art, material culture, uh, archives, rare books, it's a very varied uh, uh, collection. It also means that it was the first Jewish museum established in the United States after the Holocaust, and also the first on the West Coast. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting place in terms of what it holds and its institutional history. And over the last uh, three years, so starting in, in 2017, the Magnus was the recipient of two major gifts of art, 
that as I've learned, I'm the curator, so I actually negotiated the gift and uh, gifts and made them happen. But as I learned, um, constitute two of the four largest gifts of art to the University of California, Berkeley in its entire history. And one of them is the one I'm discussing today is a, is a collection um, all entirely devoted to the artwork and archival materials and all kinds of documentation of a, a Polish born um, artist by the name of Artur Schick, and I will tell you more about him in a second. And uh, the collection was brought to UC Berkeley in 2017, acquired by the Magnus, thanks to an important gift, and I'll, I will tell you about that as well. And um, it comprises uh, hundreds of artworks, and just recently we had opened the first ever exhibition about it. And, uh, and the exhibition focuses on the theme of human rights. Uh, but today, for, the, for your class, I'm specifically focusing on some of the artwork in the exhibition that, uh, that deals with uh, the topic of propaganda. Arthur Schick was an artist, but also very much involved in, in, a, in a, an artistic effort to denounce the crimes of Nazis, fascists, their allies throughout, throughout the world. Um, so with, with that, I will start by uh, sharing uh, my... I'm not a big fan of PowerPoints, but uh, I, I, I did create one for the occasion. I figured that it would be a way for us to keep us on track. Uh, the reason why I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of PowerPoints is that because I don't like the linearity of it. I like to be able to go back to, you know, uh, sort of dance a little bit uh, with my mind, with my eyes, and even with my heart, if I can. And uh, so PowerPoints kind of put us in a, in a fixed, uh, in a fixed uh, trajectory. Um, so there is a way to thwart that plan, which is for everybody involved in, in today's Zoom uh, lecture to actually uh, participate and ask questions. Uh, and I think Isabel and I will moderate. So um, one thing, I said one thing I don't like are PowerPoints. One, one thing I do like is being interrupted. So I'll be totally fine with uh, being stopped and, and, and uh, my trajectory being diverted by, by all kinds of questions. Um, meanwhile, let me start by sharing. Uh, my screen and hopefully um, the 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 correct one. Yes, sure. <laughs> here we go. Um, and um, so, so today I'm 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 sort of zooming in, as in not only I will be uh, as you as obviously uh, I I'm, I'll be using Zoom to to connect with you, but I'm actually literally zooming into artwork. Uh, artwork uh, that uh, Artusha created over several decades and that um, is uh, pretty much all in very miniature size. So everything you see is in there in real life is not much bigger or sometimes much smaller than the size of, um, of, uh, of, your, uh, of your laptops. I assume many of you are connecting through laptops. So, uh, when, when you see what I'm showing you, don't imagine something very big. It's something that very easily fits into what you're seeing uh, today. Um, Arthur Schick. Arthur Schick was born, first, first of all, the, the last name is pronounced Schick, as in if it had a, a, an S-H in, uh, and not an S-Z-Y. Um, was born in Łódź, Poland. Łódź, a, a, an important industrial center. His family was a family industrialist. He, he was born in 1994. 1990, uh, very young age, he, de he developed a, an interest and love for visual arts and uh, traveled to Paris and studied in Paris. Um, and I'm just uh, making sure that everybody's admitted to it. Yeah, there, there are a few more students joining in. So Isabel, you may want to help with that as yeah. we as we do this. Um, and um, his life was very much framed by the two world wars, by the collapse of, of uh, European democracies. And he was a refugee, not only a transnational artist between Poland and, and France, but eventually had to bring himself and his work to the United Kingdom, especially because he, his art was very political and very engaged against the rise of the Nazi regime. And by 1939, he was, he was a refugee in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Then through Canada, arrived to New York City in 1940, uh, where he set up uh, an apartment and, and his work uh, uh, on the Upper West Side, uh, where you, you see him here in a self-portrait drawing a cartoon. And if you look closely, you'll see that it's a cartoon with, uh, that depicts a skull and, and somebody in uniform 
wearing an, a Nazi armband. And, uh, and to the right is a, is a photograph of him at work in his, in his uh, studio, studio apartment in, in, uh, in Manhattan, and uh, also drawing a cartoon. And by the time he arrived to the United States, Arthur Schick was already famous as a, as a political artist. And throughout the war effort, he really contributed a lot of uh, uh, visual uh, artwork that actually went sometimes very far. It was published on, on, as we will see, on covers of many popular magazines. And uh, his work is very nuanced. It's very full of little details. So even though everything uh, fits into, into the size of, of your laptops, I will be zooming in and expanding uh, some of the details of his work just to, to see how his work essentially works, how he operated, how, how, what, what are the dynamics at place. Through this, we may imagine what kind of a, a sophisticated effort of propaganda somebody like him and his entourage uh, put forth uh, throughout World War II. Um, Arthur Schick has had a, a, an influence on other, other artists, and, and one of them is Art Spiegelman, who mentions him as, a, as an influence on his work. And this is a, 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 an interesting visual comparison of the characters coming out of the, of the white page of the cartoonist, Schick drawing them in these, in these, uh, in these characters, in this case, the horrors of, of, uh, of, the, of, um, of the Nazi regime and its allies um, going onto, onto the floor, onto a, in, into a wastebasket and, and sort of haunting his, uh, his activity, just as uh, uh, the, the, the the hard history of the Holocaust that haunts uh, Art Spiegelman's life and, and work, especially Maus, uh, seems to also um, come out, come out of his, of his drawing table. Um, um, Arthur Schick was also a specialist in, in hiding himself in plain sight. He, he's often uh, present in the first person, sometimes wearing a uniform or different types of uniforms. In, in his artwork. Uh, this is a, the cover of the um, Passover Haggadah. It, it, it's an illustrated text for the, for the, uh, for the Jewish uh, uh, Passover that he published in London in 1939. And you see in the dedication page, this is to uh, one, one of the dedication pages of this work, you, you see Arthur Schick on the lower right corner and a and little bit enlarged. And, um, and before we, we, we move on, I wanted to share with you some thoughts that I record, pre-recorded about the exhibit. The Toby family Arthur Schick collection at the Magnus uh, comprises over 450 works of art and many, many items of ephemera and archival materials. We're presenting our first ever exhibition devoted to Arthur Schick. We put a small army of students at work and they helped with digitizing all the original artwork, taking photographs, mostly documenting the collection itself, but of course so also shaping a narrative around it. The main work that we did in acquiring the Toby Family Arthur Schick collection was to transform it from a privately held art collection into a publicly accessible one. So we're not gatekeepers, we're sharers of cultural content. The exhibition refers to digital tools in approaching Arthur Schick's art as a digital lens. The idea of the digital lens is not just a perspective, but it's also a way to reconstruct the artist's own gaze. When the work is projected digitally with such high resolution, it increases the visitor's appreciation when they look at the original work. This exhibition already lives online and will continue to live on the web. At the same time, we're also looking into the possibility of this exhibition traveling nationally and internationally. So we really hope it will go places. And. Uh... We do hope he will go places, but right now it only lives online. I mean, it's installed in the, in the Magnus at UC Berkeley, but it's an exhibition that only lives online. As, as I was saying in my, in my video, uh, it's the first time that we really dis focus uh, our uh, curatorial efforts on, on this collection. It was acquired in the spring of 2017, so a little over three years ago. And uh, it was an unprecedented gift to buy art to the University of California, Berkeley. Here you see on, on, on your screen, you see the article from Berkeley News uh, that highlighted this, uh, this important gift. And it was a gift that actually enabled the Magnus to grow even further because two years later, uh, we were able to acquire another important archive, the archival photographer Roman Vizniak, 
and uh, that acquisitions are very much shaped by the, the path paved by, uh, by the gift to buy the Archbishop uh, collection. So we're very grateful to the Toby family, uh, uh, Toby, Toby family and to the Toby philanthropies for enabling the Magnus to, to proceed and to be uh, path-breaking in, 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 in this effort. Um, uh, here is some of the work done digitally to, to, uh, to unpack Arthur Schick's art. We'll be dealing with the original artwork in a little bit, but I just wanted to share with you some of the animation. This is done in Photoshop and After Effects uh, with, uh, in, in collaboration with students. And it really sort of highlights how Arthur Schick works. And we'll be very much taking apart this, uh, this, art, this artwork in, from the early 40s uh, that shows the, 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 the top of, uh, of, the, of the Nazi regime. Um, the exhibition is very much based on, on history and on the, on the development and collapse of, of human rights. Uh, so in the, in the red column, in the red parts of this column of this chronology, you see Arthur Schick's lifetime. He was born in Wojciech in Poland in 1894, uh, moved around uh, quite a bit in his life and died very young of a heart attack in, uh, in the United States in 1951, only a little over 10 years after he had immigrated uh, to, to, to America. Um, if you see, the bulk of his activity is actually framed not only by the general uh, advancements for global human rights uh, that culminated in 1948 with the Universal Declaration of, 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 of uh, the Rights of Man, um, but very much by the collapse of, Euro of European democracies. This is a very quick, a very short list of what happened in Europe after World War I. And these are all the countries that fell into uh, fascist regimes. Hungary, Italy, Albania, Lithuania, and Poland uh, in the, in the mid, until the mid-20s, and then continuing to school Slavia in 29, Germany and Austria in 34, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia in 35, and so on and so forth, Greece, Spain, and Romania until 1939 with the, with the invasion of uh, occupation of Poland uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the beginning of, of World War II. So much of this artist's activity is framed uh, by these dates and by these events. And he, throughout his career, he was extremely vocal in uh, uh, denouncing what was happening uh, to, to the world and to democracy and to the ability of people to, to, to live together in a free, uh, in a free world. Um, to the point that uh, if he had uh, broader artistic ambitions uh, before the 1930s, those ambitions were kind of almost completely diverted towards uh, uh, doing political work. Uh, as we will see, however, he managed to keep his artistry and, and his aesthetics into the political work that he did. So most of what he, what he constructed throughout his career is extremely uh, nuanced, very full of all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, artistic and, and, and cultural ideas. Um, before I go into the specifics of some of the artwork in the, in the exhibition, uh, again, as a reminder, the exhibition is called In Real Times, uh, Arthur Schick, Art and Human Rights. Uh, here is a here is a, a, a quick tour uh, of the um, of the um, exhibition itself uh, in in just static pictures. But uh, you see here how uh, the work is displayed, and the exhibition almost almost entirely happens on the two sides of this uh, gallery, and then. Uh, where I'm pointing now is the entrance, and opposite the entrance is a, a big uh, display of digital uh, uh, tools. Uh, here we go. Um, there are two iPads, uh, and one iPad, the entire collection, so not just what's in, in the exhibition. The exhibition has about 50 original artworks. The entire collection has over 200, 450. So it's only a portion of the collection that's on, on display, but the entire collection is available digitized uh, so that visitors can uh, zoom in and expand the very intricate and detailed work uh, of, of this artist. Uh, on another uh, iPad station, 
the work that was done with students of cropping, digitally cropping Arthur Schick's artwork is made available so that uh, visitors using uh, um, a Photoshop mix, a, an app that allows to create mash visual mashups can actually create new, new artwork. And some of it is already available and I will share links at the end of my presentation is already available online for people to, to view. And we're also making all the cropped images available online these days. So there is a, a growing, in a way, it's an exhibition that continues to expand, even though it's, uh, it, the gallery are kind of frozen in this, uh, in this moment. Um, um, so let's, let's really get into, uh, into the artwork. And um, part of the, the idea of being able to digitally zoom in and to expand uh, the artwork of Arthur Schick is that there seems to be a, 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 almost like a cognitive dissonance between the miniature size of his artwork and the magnitude of the history that it depicts. So it's very tiny, very precise, very, uh, very methodical work full of little details, but the themes that it conf it's confronted with are absolutely incredibly uh, important uh, to this day. Um, just in, 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 in terms of, and we'll talk more about this, but if you do a little calculation about which countries and, and how countries are proceeding in limiting personal freedom around the, the pandemic crisis we're living these days, you understand that certain aspects of, of fascism and totalitarianism are still very much at work on a global scale. That very same global scale that this artist was concerned for the better part of his production. Again, as a reminder, even though we'll be seeing things in detail, uh, most of what you would see in, in, the, in, the, in real life, in the original uh, format, uh, would be not much bigger than your laptop screen uh, altogether. And in, in many cases, even much smaller than that. Um, so a way in which Arthur Schick contributes to, to denouncing the crimes of, of, of the Nazi regimes is as he arrives to the United States, he's involved in a, in a big effort to make the Holocaust known in America. Uh, it may be uh, difficult to believe these days, but until uh, the fall of 1942, when already millions of people had been uh, murdered in Eastern Europe, uh, most of uh, the rest of the world was not really aware of what was happening uh, there. Um, I, I added here, and it's part of the exhibition too, a, a quote from Emanuel Ringelblum, who was an archivist who created an archive that was buried underground in the Warsaw Ghetto. And so part of it was recovered after, after the end of World War II. Um, and he, he documents how in June of 1942, when the Warsaw Ghetto was in full function and, and killing machines were in full function in, in, in Eastern Europe, um, uh, the, the English radio was able to broadcast a, a, a program that documented what was happening to the Jews in Poland. And, and uh, even though we know uh, that uh, Ringelblum himself will not survive World War II and many of the people involved in documenting uh, the Holocaust and what was happening in the Warsaw Ghetto will not survive World War II. Um, it's very emblematic what he, what he writes. He says, uh, uh, he says that basically, um, finally, we have achieved our purpose. Our purpose, th that purpose was not the purpose to survive, but the purpose was to make history in the making known to the world. Um, how does Arthur Schick co uh, collaborate with the effort of making this, uh, these events known to the, to the world? He joins in with a, a, a pretty interesting and varied group of, of people who uh, produced a, a pageant. It's sort of like, a, it, was, it was like part theater, part film, part dance, part uh, speeches, political speeches, etc. cetera, um, with the uh, text written by Ben Echt. Ben Echt was a, an important Hollywood screenwriter who had become very active in, in, since the, the middle of 1942. After learning about what was happening in Eastern Europe, wrote an article denouncing uh, the Holocaust, which was not yet referred to as the Holocaust, but Nazi crimes uh, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and his article was picked up by Reader's Digest. So he went into America's homes and people started reading about it. And this was the fall of 1942. 
in early 1943. He collaborated with Peter Bergson, who, who was a, a, an activist who was uh, trying to raise funds in America to, to support a Jewish army in Palestine. He was an advocate of Jewish self-defense, but also uh, um, um, German composer Kurt Weill, uh, best known for the music he, he wrote uh, for, the, for the place of Bertolt Brecht, uh, who, had, who was a refugee in America uh, at the time and was beginning to write for, for Broadway and, and others. And uh, Broadway directors and, and uh, stage managers, all, all kinds of people were involved in this. And here is a, is a video from, from, the, uh, from when the, the, uh, the pageant was presented. It was first presented in Madison Square Garden in New York City and tra then traveled across America all the way to uh, the Hollywood Bowl. So if you do a quick search on, on YouTube, you will also find the video about the entire presentation, well over an hour long uh, of this pageant at the Hollywood Bowl in, 1940, in, the, in, the, in the summer of 1943. Um, this is a video that's available only through the, the video channel of the um, Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. So we're going to, um, not, we're not going here, we're going to stay here and we're going to, to see this video. provided the video starts. See. Here we go. The pageant, We Will Never Die, is New York's Jewish protest against Nazi massacre. In Lubyen, 500 of our women and children were led to the marketplace and stood against the vegetable stalls we knew so well. Here the Germans turned machine guns on us and killed us all. Remember us. And a great dramatic appeal is made as Paul Muni tells of Nazi crimes against helpless people. There are four million Jews surviving in Europe. The Germans have promised to deliver to the world by the end of the year a Christmas package of four million dead Jews. And this is not a Jewish problem. It is a problem that belongs to humanity, and it is a challenge to the soul of man. Then a lament for two million people. Etc. I will let you watch the, the rest of the video. On, and I'm, I'm going to share the whole, the whole presentation with, uh, with, uh, with the class afterwards so that you can uh, retrieve uh, links and, and, and more. Um, let's look at how Arthur Schick collaborated in this. His, his visual art was very much in, in part of this effort. And um, we just heard the speaker mentioning four million Jews waiting for death and how, here's the, I'm looking at the bottom of this poem, how uh, the Nazi regime was present, preparing a Christmas package, uh, a present for humanity. Um, so this is a poem that Ben Echt, who, whose lyrics very much part of the pageant that we just uh, discussed, um, uh, a poem that he wrote and published in various, uh, in various uh, print outlets in America in, uh, in early 1943. And he was here illustrated by Arthur Schick. So we can read the poem from top to bottom. And uh, it's, it's a poem that really, it's, a, it's presented as a ballad of the doomed Jews of Europe. It, it's, it's more of a denunciation than a, than a poem itself. And it also has a visual narrative that seems to go opposite of the poem itself. We read the poem, the lyrics, the, the, the words of the poem from top to bottom. There is a big F, capital F before the four million Jews. And the, and, the, and the poem, the ballad can be read from top to bottom. Whereas uh, Arthur Schick's visual work, and again, this, this was published widely in, in the United States, uh, goes the opposite direction, goes from the bottom to the top. Let me just uh, take this apart for you. Here is the whole poem. And at the very bottom, we see a uh, Nazi threat against, uh, against Jewish people. Uh, we know they're Jewish because of the, of the, of the symbols of, of religious 
uh, Judaism. And, uh, but we see that uh, uh, young people, old people, children, men and women are all equally under threat. Again, let's remember this is the beginning of 1943 when most of the world was not aware of what was going on in, in Eastern Europe at the time. And what the people in distress are doing, they're making a phone call. You see that a, a telephone is held by this character and there is a wire. And if we follow the wire, we go up and we see how the wire goes all the way to the United Nations. And the phone rings, but there is no answer. Again, remember that this, the size of this artwork is very much the size. If you, if you were to put your, 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 the screen of your laptop sideways, you would have the original size of what we're seeing here. So it's very tiny and a lot of little, little, little details uh, uh, that provide incredible commentary. And so this is a denunciation that's basically in line with uh, what uh, the, the words of the pageant we just heard were saying, that this is not just a Jewish problem, it's a problem of the world. The problem is that the United Nations, which are there to, to, to protect uh, people, are not really answering the call. Here it is, the phone ringing, and the four freedoms, which were announced at, at the beginning of World War II uh, by Franklin, for President Roosevelt. 1941, so freedom of speech, worship, freedom from want, and, uh, and from fear are being performed not just by an angel, here we see the four freedoms, uh, but by, uh, with the musical accompaniment of a cello played by a skeleton. Um, this is all visual, and, and above them is, is a Nazi branded vulture uh, that, that, uh, that is, uh, that is overlooking the entire scene. Uh, but this is a, a huge denunciation of, of passivity of, of world authorities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the beginning of a genocide. And um, it's narrated uh, visually, as I was saying, in the opposite direction uh, that the words of the poem of the ballad are, uh, are laid out. And uh, in other words, they offer more than a commentary uh, to, to the lyrics. They, they, they present a broader and invite the viewers to, 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 to see a broader uh, dimension in, in, in the message. Um, another work that, uh, that, uh, that Schick uh, uh, creates exactly around this time in early 1943 is, uh, is titled De Profundis. De Profundis comes from, uh, uh, from the Book of Psalms, but interestingly enough, it's, the title is in Latin and not in, in Hebrew. The, the, the Psalms were written originally in, in Hebrew. Uh, in other words, uh, Sheikh is using uh, materials from both Jewish and Christian traditions to once again explain that the plight of Jews in Eastern Europe and, and the, the crimes of genocide that were being uh, committed at the time are not only an affair of the victims themselves, but they are, they are a matter for the whole world to, to ponder. If we go closer into this, into this work, we, we see uh, even better the, the, the various motifs and, and especially a, a Jewish Christ. So it's a deposed Christ that's holding the tablets of the law with the Ten Commandments and with the, the beginning letters of the, of the list of the Ten Commandments in Hebrew next to a, a Jew wearing, wearing a head covering and, and holding, uh, and holding a, a Torah scroll, in other words, the, the scrolls of the Hebrew Bible as they're uh, kept inside a synagogue, all uh, sitting on top of a pile of suffering and dying people. And um, if we look closer at the title, we see that, and this is really tiny, so only if we magnify it the way I'm showing you now, we can see it. We see that the, the symbol of the of, uh, of the memento mori of death from Christian visual traditions is present along with, with angels. And, and uh, the, the story, the biblical story of Job, here is the Job, uh, and in other words, the suffering of the just is, is equally represented, but in an incredibly, let me just uh, go back, in an incredibly tiny way. If you, if you go back here now, you see that it's, it's 
that job is right there. It's, it's very much hidden also on your, on your laptop. So this type of magnification is, is essential in understanding uh, the details and look at all the details, the decorative details, including little Hebrew lettering, et cetera, that are part of, 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 the, of this work. Uh, this is very much the style of, of this artist. What's fascinating is how he adapted this uh, passion and, and proclivity for, for tiny details to the broad message of propaganda. So he was able to sort of reconcile artistry with, uh, with the needs, the political needs of producing visual culture that would be hopefully effective in, 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 uh, in gathering people behind a behind cause. We'll see more of this uh, shortly. Um, he also created an, um, uh, more work. And let me see if I, if I can get back to this. I, I think I'm missing a, a, an image for some reason. Um, I, I was going to show you the original that was then used for uh, a stamp booklet that was raising money for the same organization that, organized, that put together this pageant in, uh, at Madison Square Garden. So his artwork was, was repurposed to raise funds. So this was a, 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 an emergency committee to save the Jewish people of Europe that was uh, part of the effort of the same, uh, the same people who were uh, working together to make, uh, to make uh, the genocide in Eastern Europe known uh, by, uh, by all in America. Uh, so these are uh, two Jewish children refugees. And, uh, and uh, this, this is the cover of a booklet that included uh, stamps. So people would buy stamps and this way would support the cause of, um, of helping uh, refugees and helping victims of the Nazi regime. Um, here is um, a, a short video with uh, scholar and author Deborah Lipstadt, uh, who visited the exhibition shortly before it closed. In, in February, she was, uh, she was uh, a, an invited speaker to the UC Berkeley campus and came by the Magnus. And uh, so these are her thoughts about Arthur Schick. And uh, as a reminder, Deborah Lipstadt is a major historian of both the Holocaust, Holocaust denial, uh, and and uh, very much of the, the American reaction to the news of the Holocaust. Uh, so she's a scholar of this time period, the time period we're discussing. Here's Deborah. Arthur Schick becomes a prime mover in the fight against Nazism and the fight against fascism in the greatest war effort the United States had ever undertaken. I think the work is very important. It shows the absurdity of anti-Semitism. It shows the horrific nature of anti-Semitism. And it also brings down the perpetrators, it makes them human, it makes them, it takes them off their pedestal. But he's not doing it to make light of them. He's doing it to humanize them and say these men are not great leaders, but these men are small people who deserve to be seen in that way. What happens when a nation stops caring about what's done in its name? Or even worse, in the case of Germany, what happens when a nation participates in what's being done in its name? It's also important to show how the pen or whatever instrument you use to, to draw with today uh, can be used as a weapon, a weapon in the cause of human rights, a weapon in the cause of stopping authoritarianism, stopping genocide. So we're even more grateful to Deborah Lipstadt for sharing her thoughts uh, with us uh, uh, because it's bringing our work uh, uh, back to life uh, in, a, in a very real way. And I feel like maybe by watching this, all, all of you who are listening, I, I, I love them uh, today, will have almost visited the exhibition, although I sincerely hope that we will soon be able to visit it uh, together. Um, alongside the effort to make the Holocaust known, Sheikh focused specifically on, on what was happening. And this was a few months after the pageant in, in, in Madison Square Garden was happening with the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, you have a description from Marek Edelman, one of the few survivors of the, of the military units that fought against the, against the Nazis 
during the Warsaw Ghetto advisor. So this is a testimony from the late 1980s. Uh, Marek Edelman, Edelman lived his entire life in Poland after World War II. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's an incredible, heroic, and tragic story that, of course, hit the imagination of, of the world. At that point, almost in real time, as news were, were being shared uh, across, across the globe, and we see how Artoshek devotes his, uh, his art to uh, providing a visual record of the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, as you can imagine, images were not available. The only images that were available were the ones of Nazi propaganda. So uh, in a way, these, uh, these pictorial reconstructions, uh, I'll, 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 albeit fictional as they might be, were actually very much uh, taken in real time. Um, he, he painted the, the, the one on the left. Uh, most of his medium, media are, are pencil, ink, uh, gouache, some tempera in the color, uh, in the color work, but a lot of inks um, all, 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 all around. And uh, what's interesting about, about these, uh, these portrayals is that they actually portray real people. There are, there are real portraits of some of the military leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. And um, the various political components of the, of the, of the uprising are, are somewhat equally represented in these, in these drawings. So they are uh, a way to portray history, history in the making, but also a way to counteract the visual propaganda that was being churned out by the Nazi uh, propaganda machine by providing alternative images, even though they are not real life images, they're not, they're not photographic images or, 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 or uh, moving images. They, they are images that are uh, clearly aiming at portraying history in the making and reality. So reality is extremely uh, co-essential to this work. And like, again, let's zoom into some of these to see all the details. These are some of the protagonists of the, of the uprising. I'm oh, sorry. And, um, and, uh, and you see that always there are all kinds of tiny details, including you see the tiny hand of the of the child Jewish child victim uh, about to be grabbed by a dying uh, Nazi soldier wearing Nazi insignia, and everything is extremely elaborate and extremely accurate in its uh, in 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 the in the depictions, um, almost as if it were pho photography, but it's not photography. It's it it is visual art. It's it's all drawn by hand, most likely using a magnifying glass to see details uh, very, uh, very well. And, and you see the, the, the details up down to, to very small uh, parts. Um, Arthur Schick is, is um, very involved in, in uh, depicting Adolf Hitler. Who isn't? He, uh, Adolf Hitler is such a hauntingly iconic figure. And of course, he, he, he was the protagonist of the, of, of the violations of human rights that, that Chick was, uh, was uh, the big protagonist. But um, he was not alone. Uh, around the same time that Chick portrays uh, Hitler, Charlie Chaplin uh, directed and acted into a very important uh, film, The Great Dictator. And here's what uh, Chaplin said about, uh, about the movie that he, that he made. And then we're going to watch an, an excerpt and, and see what the connections are. Um, but basically, as he was produced, so he was, he, the Great Dictator was, was, uh, uh, was released in 1940. Uh, World War II had already started. Um, there was a lot of fear about the might uh, of Germany and that Germany may win uh, the war. So production houses were very concerned with releasing a movie that was so um, evidently anti-Nazi in its nature. Uh, and so, uh, he, in his autobiography, Charlie Chaplin is, is relating how um, basically his work might be censored. And he says, I was determined to go ahead for Hitler must be laughed at. Um, this is a very interesting statement and it's very much reflected in Schick's work. Um, as much as he's focused on little details, he's also exacerbating those details into caricatures when it comes to, to his political enemies. And here we'll see a gallery of, um, of um, Nazis and their, and their allies and collaborators and enablers um, as depicted by, by Arthur Schick. 
uh, we saw earlier an animated version of this artwork. This was uh, eventually used for as a as the cover of a of a widely uh, published and read uh, weekly Colliers, and uh, we have many elements in this uh, depiction. But uh, I would like to mostly focus on on the depiction of Adolf Hitler, who is. Um, so this is 1941, so a year after the release of The Great Dictator, Chap Chaplin's The Great Dictator, and uh, Hitler is, is uh, busy pinning Nazi flag flags on the globe. Uh, the globe has, and we'll see that up close, but has uh, little banners that are being pasted on by, by uh, uh, skeletons wearing Nazi uniforms, including Nazi propaganda, and a quotation from Dante's Inferno, um, abandon all hope, uh, those who enter here. Um, quotations from the, from the anthem of the, of the, I think it's the Hitler Jugend uh, in, in, as part of the globe. Uh, Nazi branded rattlesnakes. And of course the key characters of the, of the story, uh, Josef Goebbels, we'll get back to Goebbels in a little bit, uh, Adolf Hitler himself, Himmler and Goering, so the echelons, the highest echelons of the Nazi regime. And we see collaborators lying on the, on the ground. As, as, a, as a, an Italian, I'm, I'm very fond of Schick's depictions of Mussolini, including one in which Mussolini has no pants and is, is, uh, is, um, um, is behind, is uh, very visible to, to the viewers. And then uh, Philippe Petain, who was the, 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 the French collaborator of, 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 of the fascist regimes of Europe at the time. Uh, let's again go into some, some more details. But before we do that, let's see how we study the, the details. So here are some examples of the work we did. This is what, what I was showing you be, before. And um, part of the work that we did that led to the exhibition was really studying all of the different aspects of uh, these artworks. So the artwork was digitized, then all of the different characters were cropped. And then in some cases like this one, all the, the cropped images, these are multiple layers in a, in a Photoshop uh, file, were then animated in Adobe After Effects. So for those of you who are watching who are into this type of, uh, of, uh, of computer work, uh, you can see how it was, it was made. And, and then I will share with you how other works of art were treated in similar ways. This is another work that's part of the exhibition. It was all cropped into little details. And essentially, this prompted us to really go deep in studying uh, this work. Again, remember the size. The size of what you see is pretty much the size of the screen of your laptop. So it's incredibly tiny details that just emerge uh, digitally. And as I was saying, we're also making a lot of these cropped images available to the public also at this point online. Here are more of the details being cropped. Um, um, more available online to sort of foster the idea that more cartoons, more cartoon art can still be created from all these elements, all these very modular elements that are part of, of uh, Arthur Schick's aesthetics. Here are some of them. Um, here are the, the faces, you see, and, and these faces uh, show a, a, a deep study, character study. So it's not just caricature uh, to, to, to make fun of, even though as Chaplin wrote, uh, he thought Hitler must be laughed at, and this is, these are definitely laughable characters, but they're also, they're not just laughable, they're also scary characters. And, and their idiosyncrat idiosyncrasies are very much emerging. Uh, for those of us who frequented the, the uh, movie or, or photographic depictions of these historical characters, we can see that there is a lot of depth in how they are, they are portrayed. And you see that there are all kinds of little details in the artwork that, trust me, would not be visible unless this magnification that I'm performing for you were to be done. So, uh, you know, insignia and medals and, uh, and down to the smaller details of uniforms and different types of uniforms and, and, and so on and so forth. This cartoon was titled Madness. And, uh, and here is a parallel between Schick's Hitler and Chaplin's Hitler in The Great Dictator. Again, the year was 1940. Uh, Schick is 1941. Strange, these strike leaders, they're all brunettes. Not a blonde amongst them. Brunettes are travel makers, they're worse than the and Jews. I will actually wipe them out. 
too small. Carry you Not so to fast. We get rid of the Jews first, then concentrate which, on the brunettes. Uh, we shall never have peace Pico, until we have a Hitler, pure Aryan uh, race. Climbs, uh, How a, wonderful. A, a Tomania, of his room, a nation of blue-eyed plays with the globe. Not a blonde Europe, a blonde Asia, a blonde America. Uh, a blonde world. And a brunette dictator. Of dictator of the world. Let me raise it here. It's the only good trick. Uh, no, no. Yeah, here we go. Yes, dictator of the world. We'll start with the invasion of Austerlich. After that, we won't have to fight. We can bluff. Nation after nation will capitulate. Within two years, the world will be under your thumb. Believe me, I want to be alone. Caesar of Nolus, Emperor of the world. And I'm pausing here because if you have not had a chance to watch this movie, I hope that you will. So I'm just giving you a little teaser, uh, but uh, it's, it's easily available online and, and worth watching every, every second of it. But uh, we can see the, the direct visual connections between Schick's work and, 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 and Chaplin's work. Uh, but let's uh, think more about this and how this uh, imagination of Hitler is persistent in the present. First of all, in his autobiography, Chaplin also expressed regret for making the, the great dictator. Um, whereas the passage that I was quoting earlier is about him at the time that the movie was being produced. 1939, 1940, here in his autobiography is talking about after the fact. And he said, had I known that of the actual horrors of the German concentration camps, I could not have made the great dictator. I could not have made fun of the homicidal insanity of the Nazis. So on the one hand, uh, Chaplin was arguing that Hitler must be made fun of. And, and on the other, he's saying, uh, maybe not. And this ambiguity is very much part, this haunting ambiguity is very much part of of Schick's uh, depictions. Um, but these, uh, these uh, images continue to have currency today. Um, so here is a small excerpt from the movie Jojo Rabbit. And again, with our still Hitler in Arthur Schick's imagination. Uh, again, if you have not had a chance to watch this movie, another movie I highly recommend. So these are these are all movies that I that the lecture today's lecture endorses. We can talk about it with Isabel and what she thought about this movie. But here it is. No, not here. Right, just a sec. Let's see if I can get it to start. Yeah. <laughs> And we see that the, uh, the body language of, uh, of Hitler as impersonated by Taika Waititi, who is also the director of, of Jojo Rabbit, are very much part of this uh, uh, visual tradition of depicting Hitler. And, uh, and in working in, with the very fine line between tragedy and farce, that seems to inspire any depiction uh, of Hitler and entourage. Um, Schick is also involved in uh, critiquing and in a way studying uh, Nazi mythology, especially uh, Germanic mythology. And here is a very interesting example. It's a, uh, a um, again, a cartoon was published in Cosmopolitan. Uh, it's called pretty much Valhalla Incorporated. 
uh, that there will be a fair English translation of, of, of the title of the work. It appears on a panel here. And this is a work that depicts a basically an updated version of Odin's banquet, but Odin's is, has become Wotan as in the Wagnerian imagination. So Richard Wagner's operas, which very much in favor with, with the Nazi regimes are evoked along with the German, Germanic mythology that they already embodied. Except all the characters, most of the characters are again the ones that at this point have become familiar faces in, 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 the, in the cartoons we've seen thus far. Uh, we have, and we'll get back to him, a little Goebbels serving sausages. We have Goering, Benito Mussolini, Adolf Hitler. In the back is Marshal Pétain cooking in the kitchen. And, and then the, 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 the hierarchies that had made the rise of, of, uh, of the uh, Nazi regime possible in Germany are also part of the banquet. And let's look once again at some of the details here. Here are Mussolini with a nice pig's head next to him carrying and serving the table. Hitler is serving beer and the beer mugs are branded with, uh, with swastikas. Petain is in, is in, uh, is in, uh, in the back, uh, cooking with a pot on the stove. And um, here is Wotan, the, the, the sort of the Wagnerian um, heir to, to Odin in the, in the Nordic uh, mythologies. Wotan uh, all branded with swastikas. And uh, next to him is a small library. I highlighted it here on the right for you. Uh, his his feet are on a on a bear rug, and it's a it's a Jewish man wearing a, a, a Jewish head covering. That's the that's part of the bear rug. His left foot is on Heine's works, in other words, stomping on the German Jewish literary and cultural heritage. And um, from Kausiswitz, so that the, the the theory war is 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 mentioned here at the bottom, and then the 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 bookshelf has a cover of Der Sturmer. You see it here, highlighted the 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 Nazi the, the main outlet of of Nazi propaganda uh, in Germany, and then all the quote unquote classics of European racist and proto Nazi uh, theory. Uh, Rosenberg, Gobino, Chamberlain, etc. So um, all of the precursors and 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 fellows of the Nazi regime are uh, are uh, highlighted here. Um, as you can see again, and again, we're talking about a very small size in the original artwork. Uh, all all the uh, elements uh, are again present, and uh, think about this work appearing on in in a major. Uh, press outlet in America and, and denouncing uh, Nazism and its ideologies in, in a very nuanced and very meticulous way. So it's a formal propaganda that's also kind of culturally very elevated. It's not, it's not, just, uh, it's not just punching to the gut. It's not trying to, to only, uh, uh, to only uh, denounce crimes, but it's also uh, trying to expose the uh, issues embedded in a whole way of life, in a whole, in a whole world. Francesco, could we pause for a moment? Yes, um, I was, I'm actually almost done, but uh, I, I just wanted to share the echoes of this in case you think, and this is my last piece of evidence, so I'm, I am actually done, uh, is that uh, if you think that, uh, that all of these elements, Goebbels, Wagner's music, are only a thing of the past, well, you may want to rethink that. This is, was in a news cycle only a couple months ago. The, the, um, essentially the equivalent of the Minister of Culture for the right-wing regime in Brazil uh, released a video in which he based his vision for the arts in, the, in, in Brazil upon a speech by Josef Goebbels. And the video had a soundtrack of Wagner's music. Eventually, uh, Roberto Alvim, the, the, the culture chief of, of Brazil, lost his job because of this, but only because there was a huge pushback. So it's, it's a story that can be easily retrieved from the recent news cycle. And um, Euronews uh, did the helpful thing of both translating and pointing the, the correspondence between this 
uh, modern speech in Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, and Goebbels' uh, original words. So you'll see how these words map with those at the, the bottom right is Goebbels, uh, Joseph Goebbels, many decades before. There is a, 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 a striking coincidence. And then we will shortly see the actual video. Here we go. Arte brasileira da próxima década será heroica e será nacional. Será dotada de grande capacidade de envolvimento emocional e será igualmente imperativa, posto que profundamente vinculada às aspirações urgentes do nosso povo. Ou então não será nada. Etc. Again, this is a, a story that can be easily retrieved through the recent news cycle, but struck me because it came out as we were launching the exhibition and 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 seeing uh, what, what was part of our research and, and the unpacking of this uh, artwork uh, in, played out in real life, in real time, uh, was particularly striking and somewhat revealing. Um, I uh, put together, and so when I share these slides with, with you uh, uh, through Isabel, uh, you will have links to a variety of resources uh, about the exhibition itself. And, um, and if you still want more after all of this, you can visit magnus.berkeley.edu uh, to, to find out more about it. And with this, I think I'm going to, to stop and hopefully I can even find a way to, to um, un, uh, unshare my screen. And, Okay. Here I am. You go again. Thanks a lot. You are absolutely welcome. Um, if it's okay with you, I read all the questions that the students prepared. Some of them refer to the uh, Magnus collections, others refer to the uh, cartoon madness and you ex already explained a lot of things but I would like to give the students the opportunity to address absolutely we have just the time to do that so do you want are you reading the questions uh, for me yeah, no no I, I want to, I'm waiting now if someone will oh, we're, we're hoping that somebody will unmute themselves and ask a question I'll ask a question Please. <laughs> can, can you can okay. you say who you are? My name is Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. Um, I was just wondering, like, like for you, like a personal question to you, like, what made you like so interested, like, in this? Like, what made you like? In in what exactly? Because it it has many many parts. Like uh, the like. Like, for example, Arthur, I don't know. Arthur Schick. Yeah, Schick. Um, what made you, like, want to, like, study this stuff? Like, like just, like, like the Holocaust? Yes. And, like, well, you know, uh, I guess that uh, the general issue of human rights is one that is, if, if the question is personal, that's very dear to me for a number of reasons that are both personal and professional. Uh, the exhibition that was in the same gallery just before this one was one that was called Memory Objects and focused on what refugees carry with them when they leave what used to be their home and, and how, considering that there are, there are um, about a seventh of world population now in movement, right now sheltering in place but in great, in great, great danger, as we know, uh, in the refugee population. Uh, one of the questions yeah. coming up was, was how, how is uh, culture history reflected in this experience? So we were thinking about objects as carrier of a bearer of memory, of personal memory. Um, that being said, um, as I was saying at the beginning, this was a, an unprecedented gift to UC Berkeley. So it begged a, a, that I'm talking about the Arthur Schick collection at the Magnus. 
So it begged a, a specific uh, type of uh, analysis. It was, it was absolutely timing. And for me, the idea of, of syncing Arthur Schick's work with, and especially his work around the Holocaust, but not only in some of his art. And if you follow the links that I will share, you will find a lot more. He was also involved in denouncing the violations of civil rights in America, the, end, the later part of his life and, and well beyond that. But um, essentially um, providing a, a way to read his work through the, the crisis of global, of global human rights felt like a, a, a good way to kind of embrace the whole of this production and maybe find multiple point of entries for, for others, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Thank you. That was a good answer. <laughs> Are there any further questions? Anybody's brave enough to unmute themselves? And, and I actually have a comment. Um, oh, I definitely enjoyed this collection a lot. I have visited the Magnus Center uh, several times and, and listened to, uh, I think last year there was a presentation by John Connolly uh, yep. and in the year in the semester before by Omar Bartov, who gave lectures on Polish history and, and Polish uh, sort of the, um, I suppose, interwar Poland. And, and uh, I, I would actually love to see this in, in person. Um, well, but is it, is we all next... hope that you'll be able to. Sorry, I'm not hearing you anymore. Evan? Yes, I, I yes. sorry, I just, it's quite all right. We're all getting used to all these glitches. I think we need to unmute you. Uh, oh, should I? Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> Uh, oh, there's two of you. That's what it is. There were two Evans. Are you back? I'm back. I'm sorry. Okay. No, I just wanted to make a, a comment, but Please. Uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that collection. And um, thank you so much for your um, talk today on this. I, I'm definitely going to keep this in consideration as, you know, I, I'm actually, I very much enjoy studying Central and Eastern European history. And I think it's a really interesting depiction of, of, um, of fascism and, and sort of this idea of, of uh, of refugees and and also the caricatures to perhaps uh, explain the a little bit better the the sentiments and moods that were felt among the the refugees and and people living in that time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, hi, Carlos. Sí, cómo está? Eh, yo una demanda. <laughs> but let's let's keep the maybe I'm I'm happy to to switch to Italian or Spanish, but. Let, let, let's keep maybe English so that everybody else can follow as well. No, no, of course. The, the question was going no to problem. be English for my, my peer. Please. Um, I don't know, like after analyzing the repulse attack and other of the, the art, the, the paintings or whatever, I, I found a huge similarity with uh, Diego Rivera's and David Alfaro Siqueiros, like muralist mm -hmm. political movements. I don't know, like, is there any correlation between this movement and, and Arthur Schick? Or oh, is they're, they're working at a similar time. They have comparable foes, mm -hmm. political enemies. Uh -huh. And I would say most importantly, it seems like it's a time in which many artists could not not confront reality. Okay could not not try to depict what was happening to them and around them in as explicit and direct ways as possible. And maybe that's the main commonality. In other words, it's a time in which history kind of takes over a lot of artistic expressions. I mean, think about what we watched of Charlie Chaplin, uh -huh. a comedian who made a name for himself globally as a comedian that goes on the screens of the world announcing. Adolf Hitler in such an explicit, direct way. So I think that's, that's the main thread. And then <clears throat> I think you're, you're probably on a very interesting path in terms of the, the composition of some of the works that Arthur Schick puts forth. He's kind of varied. He's not, he's not always like that, but, uh, but the intensity and the, the multi-layered messages that are there, this, so this multi-layered kind of aesthetics, I think you are 
they're on target in, in comparing the two. So it's a very, very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Um, I, I, I don't know if students really like this and sometimes I like to pick some of the questions because I think yeah. it's really interesting. <clears throat> I'm not doing this because I think, oh, this was an excellent question, question and all the questions I'm not addressing, they were not good. This is not yeah. at all my intention. But um, I wanted to, I don't know if Nelson is among us or is with us. So he, uh, because we also talked about the propaganda exhibition, Degenerate Art in 37 in, and a lot of abstract artists were considered to be degenerate uh, artists. And Nelson asked, um, an, I think an interesting question. So how can we interpret Chic among um, those avant-garde artists who painted in an abstract way and Schick, I am just summarizing his questions. He referred to like uh, medieval techniques and Renaissance. So how can mm -hmm. we explain yeah. this? Well, explaining actually doesn't come easy. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a good question. It's a very good point. It seems like, you know, when, I, when, you know, the press was coming through the exhibition and I was being asked questions, one question that I really liked was, um, what would you ask Arthur Schick? <laughs> and and um, and I wondered, you know, I, how lonely he might he might have felt, uh, meaning artistically. It seemed like he was incredibly well networked. He he knew all kinds of people, both in the arts, in politics, in governments, uh, and and so on and so forth. But stylistically, aesthetically, he's very much one of a kind. It's mm -hmm. hard to compare him to anyone else mm -hmm. working at the same time. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, he's clearly aware of what's going on artistically around him. Mm -hmm. So even though he's, um, we d didn't have time to go into this, but there are some, some of his works, especially one early work from the 1920s in which he kind of pokes fun at Cubism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so, but at the same time, he evokes, uh, you know, uh, symbolism and so he, he he's extremely aware of the various currents of art of his time and he seems to be going in his own uh, on his own path and so that's why I'm saying if he felt lonely as in artistically mm -hmm. aesthetically not yeah. a, not as a person not 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 in his life uh, in, in social life and uh, so yeah so it, it, yeah, it's a very an, another very good point mm -hmm. yeah okay um, are there any further questions? Yeah, I, I have myself one uh, one question I was um, like thinking about. So um, a, a lot of Germans after 1945 said, <coughs> oh, we did not know anything about concentration camps and all the crimes which the uh, Nazis committed. And as a historian, I can say that before 1942, it was very unusual if people knew something about concentration and extermination camps. Um, I was wondering how well known Artur Schick was, because if we uh, check, for instance, where he published his um, pieces of art, you, I think um, Madness was um, published in Colliers, and you also mentioned reading. Metropolitan. He was on the cover of Time magazine. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there, it's it's basically, you know, the the, I mean, it's it's mass media of its yes. of its time. This is what I wanted to know. So absolutely. So especially in America, yeah. it, this but is especially in America. Yeah. It refers to the U.S., but in in the U.S., he was pretty well known. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. That's one of my one of my questions. Okay. Um, if you don't want to add something else, and if there are no more questions, I would use um, like a short a few minutes to just explain what I will do next uh, Thursday. Absolutely. Before I will finish yeah. the session, and thank you. So. Um, we talked about, um, in terms of propaganda, we focused on 
the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community, which was an early topic of Nazi propaganda. We focused, we talked about anti-Semitism as propaganda topic. And also, if you remember um, the photos made by Heinrich Hoffmann, we also focused on the Führerkult. And on Thursday, I would like to focus on a late propaganda topic. This is uh, the topic of total war. We already touched on it when we talked about um, the one of, uh, uh, when we discussed uh, one of Goebbels' speeches. So total war and Nazi propaganda will be my topic on Thursday. And I would um, ask all students to read David Wells' uh, chapter five and send me two questions or comments you would like to discuss um, by uh, 12 o'clock on uh, Thursday. So this is my this is my plan and goal for Thursday. And I would like to thank you very much. I really thank enjoyed you. this tour and thanks for supporting and cooperating with me. And I absolutely, absolutely. And the same, the same to you. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to collaborate with you, and I'm glad that we're able to do it. Yes, me too. <laughs> in, you know, online, and and glad that we were able to develop so many online resources around this project. That it's, uh, it's you know, yeah. it's, it was relatively easy to to corral all of them, and hope I hopefully I gave a yeah. a, 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 a well-rounded picture for for your yeah. students and for your class. So good luck with the rest of the semester, all of you. Thank you. This is and, thank you. Uh, oh, thank you're so, you welcome. so much. You are so welcome. Thank you so much. And, uh, thank you. And I hope to see you in person. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Let's, let's hope that, uh, that we'll be able to, you'll be able to visit the exhibition mm -hmm. and that we'll, we'll not be as distant as we have to be right now. So <laughs> hang in there. And Stay safe. Work. You too. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Well, Isabel, thank you again incredibly yeah. much. And I will share the recording with you once I once I get it from the cloud. Wonderful. And okay. I will upload it to B courses. Fantastic. Okay. You so, take care. Yeah. Be well. Bye bye. Bye. You too.